welcome everyone to this special event. Some of you know this. This is part of a series of special events. And every time we have incredible special guests. Now, before we get there, for those of you who don't know me and accompany, just a super quick introduction and then we get started. Now, my name is Andrea. I'm the head of Ideas on Stage UK. I'm a presentation coach. We specialize in working with business owners, leaders, and the teams who want to become more confident presenters. In the last 14 years, we've worked with thousands of clients around the world, including companies like, and, and business leaders from companies like Amazon, Salesforce, eBay, Spotify, the World Bank, and more than 500 TEDx speakers. A mission is to stop great ideas from failing just because of the way they are presented. And a vision is to help hundreds of thousands of business leaders inspire their audiences, increase their influence, and make a positive impact in the world. And that's it. Enough about me. Now, the format of this session is a bit different from the, the previous special events that we had. This time, we are going to have, instead of a formal presentation, we are going to have a live Q&A session with our guest. And so for you, a couple of things. One is, now you don't have to, but if you feel like it, if you'd like to turn your webcam on, that's the best thing we can do to have a good connection with each other, especially in a Q&A session. And also, if you have any questions for our guest, please type your questions in the chat. I do have lots of questions or topics I'd love to explore with our guest today, but I know already that I will not have time to go through all the things that I have in mind, but I would be more than happy to ask your questions instead. So either now or throughout the event, any question you have, feel free to type it in the chat. And our guest today is a leading expert in communication with decades of experience as an educator, author, podcast host, and coach. As a lecturer in organizational behavior at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, he teaches popular classes in strategic communication and effective virtual presenting. He hosts the popular award-winning podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart, the podcast, and his new book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, How to Speak su Successfully When You're Put on the Spot, gives you tangible, actionable skills to help even the, the most anxious of speakers succeed when speaking spontaneously. So think about situations like answering questions, giving feedback, making small talk, dealing with mistakes. That's what we will be talking about today. And I know you are going to learn a lot today. So please give our guest a big virtual round of applause and please welcome Matt Abrahams. Matt, thank you very much for your time. Great to see you again. How are you? I am doing quite well. It's great to be back with you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And again, we will be talking about, uh, in a similar way as we've done with the, with the podcast some time ago, and we will be talking about all things spontaneous speaking, communication, in the moment communication, and communication on the spot. And I would like to start with something I didn't ask you when I interviewed you the first time, which mm -hmm. is a, a story. You, in your book, you tell a story of how you had to think spontaneously as a kid because of how you fell in the alphabet. So if I think about Abraham's A, B, I guess that's at the very, very top. So for those who haven't read the book, can you please just quickly tell us that, 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 that story, the anecdote? And also, how has that impacted and affected your, your career and also your research into this space, spontaneous speaking? Thank you. Yes. So first, let's define what we mean by spontaneous speaking. If you think about it, most of the communication we do in most of our life, professional and personal, is in the moment. It's not the planned presentation or the pitch or the meeting with agenda. It's in the moment. Somebody asks you a question, as you have just done. They ask for feedback. You need to make small talk, introduce yourself. All of these happen in the moment. And we often don't get any training on how to do this. 
I, because of my last name, have been spontaneous speaking for most of my life. You know, I, I as a teacher, uh, I can share that, you know, we tend to get lazy and like order in things. And often we will seat students alphabetically. And because my last name is AB, I always knew where I would sit, front row, first part of the classroom. And when the teachers would go around the room for, for different assignments, they would often start alphabetically. It's easier to record it in your grade book that way. And so my whole life has been spent spontaneous speaking. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I'm great at it. I had to work very hard to improve my abilities, but uh, it is something that I, the pressure I have known for a long, long time. In fact, only twice in my entire career has somebody ever come in front of me. And it's quite strange now. I'm, I'm just so used to being the one who goes first. But I personally learned how you have to respond in the moment. And it piqued my curiosity uh, early on in my life about speaking and about how we have to just be comfortable and confident in that moment. Matt, in, in your book, there are a few ideas that may be perceived as counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. One of them is that you, you talk about the idea that imperfection is, is okay. And I've got a few statements from your book connected to this idea. Mm -hmm. I have them here. You say that, for example, good enough is great. You mm -hmm. talk about maximizing mediocrity. Mm -hmm. You also talk about something that I love. You say we need to reframe mistakes as mistakes. And I don't, I don't know with my accent if people can can spot <laughs> Hear the difference. The difference. Yes. Yeah, mi mistakes versus mistakes. And yes. and you also talk about striving for connection rather than perfection. So if yeah. you think about all of these things and the idea that imperfection is okay can you can you tell us more absolutely so uh, a methodology i created and this was created out of a very specific need for my day job where i teach at stanford's business school the deans came to me several years ago and said we have a problem our very talented students are struggling with cold calling and i believe many of your participants here today remember when the teacher looks at you and says what do you think and you have to respond Many of our incredibly bright students, very capable students, would struggle with that, not because they didn't know the answer, but because being put on the spot was the challenge. And so I began to develop a methodology to this day. Uh, Stanford MBAs, within the first three weeks of coming to campus, have the opportunity to take uh, training to help them in this methodology. The biggest barrier in our communication is ourselves. And so this methodology has two components. It has mindset and approach and messaging. And what you're talking about is the mindset piece. Many of us, when we're put on the spot, we want to do it the best we can. We want to give the best answer, the most interesting and relevant feedback. We want to be the most interesting person in small talk. And that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on ourselves. And so if we can reduce that pressure and focus where the focus really should be, which is connecting with our audience, we can do better. So let me say a, a couple things to address those issues. First and foremost, there is no right way to communicate. I, like you, have been coaching people for decades, and there is no right way. There are better ways and worse ways, but no right way. So to put that pressure on ourselves makes it more difficult. And it comes down to cognitive bandwidth. Your brain is like a computer. It's not a perfect analogy, but it works. When I am focused on judging every single thing I say, I have less bandwidth to focus on what I'm trying to get out. So I like to say, focus on connection over perfection. The goal is to connect, make your content relevant. And when we one way to lower that volume is to remind ourselves that good enough is great. This is an idea that comes from improvisation. And I've borrowed that term to, to teach my students uh, what you said, which is maximize mediocrity. Focus on just getting the task done and connecting with your audience. And that frees up a lot of bandwidth to actually do it better. So I'm not saying never evaluate and judge what you're saying. You should, but turn that volume down, focus more on the audience. Another tool that helps is what you also mentioned, the difference between a mistake and a missed take. If you know anything about television or movie production, the director often will have the actors do multiple takes of the scene. They even have that clapboard, take one, take two. If we see mistakes simply as one way of doing something, and we can do it a different way, that can help us get through it. So if I'm in the midst of a, a communication and I don't feel it goes well, 
I simply say to myself, take two. I try again. Maybe I tell a story or I ask a question to get the same point across rather than beating myself up and feeling bad about it. So changing our mindset, maximize mediocrity, see things as mistakes, help us do better. So mindset and message, and we'll get to, to message as well. Before we do, or, or as we do that, I'd like to touch on another counterintuitive idea, which is the fact that you say that you can and you should prepare for communication on the spot. So often when when we think about spontaneous speaking, we we assume that it's it's spontaneous. So we just go there and see what happens. But you say that actually it is possible and that's what we should do. We should prepare for in the moment communication. Again, Matt, can you can you tell us more about this? Yes, absolutely. So it is counterintuitive that you can prepare to be spontaneous. But if you think about it, if you think of an athlete, for example, athletes are constantly preparing. They're doing drills. They're preparing their bodies and their minds for when they are in the moment of the game. And the game is spontaneous. It doesn't always go as you planned. So it's the same sort of idea. So we have to prepare our mindset. We have to work on anxiety. Many of us are nervous in our, in our communication. So we start by working on anxiety. We see these circumstances as opportunities, not as threats. We listen well. These are all areas of focus. And there are very specific drills. I talk about them in the book and when I teach to help you focus with each of these steps, much like a football player would run around cones. A basketball player would take a series of, of practice shots. These things are the things that help us be ready for when we're in the moment and need to respond. Uh, Matt, now, now, now you mentioned basketball. and You made me think about another concept, or maybe it's something similar. It's connected to what you've just said uh, that, that I found in, in your book. And it's connected to the question, how do we handle mistakes? Now, you did tell us that it's not really a mistake. It's a missed take. But if yes. you think about, okay, I'm, I'm in the middle of communication and I think that it's not going well. Maybe I'm making some mistakes or I've made some mistakes in the book. You do reference, I don't know if it was basketball or baseball, it was, a, yes. a coach, uh, maybe a famous coach who talks about the importance of moving on to the next play rather than focusing on what just happened. Again, can you can you can you share that that example, please? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so here in the United States, a very very famous uh, college basketball coach, Mike Shashevsky. He's recently retired. Coach K. He taught all of his players a very important skill, which is next play. So if you're a basketball player and you miss a shot, instead of standing on the court staring at the basket that you missed and ruminating over how you could have done better, why missing has adversely affected your team, you need to get hustling down the court because the other team is already down there. And with you not there, you're actually putting your team at yet another disadvantage. Many of us, when things do not go the way we want them to, in that moment, we ruminate, we beat ourselves up. We stand there and instead we don't move on. So it's very important that we actually take the time to reflect later, but not in the moment. So I make a distinction between rumination and reflection. Reflection is something you do after the fact. And reflection is incredibly important. It is one of the three skills that we need to do to get better at anything. To get better at any skill, you need to get repetition, reflection, and feedback. But rumination, can bring us down, it can anchor us into the past, and it prevents us from adjusting and adapting in the moment. So I love this notion of next play. Simply move on. Later, you can think about what you could do to make things better. So next play, along with this notion of maximizing mediocrity and missed takes, really helps you to reframe these situations and be your, your best self in those moments where you need to communicate. I love it. Uh, and Matt, in preparation for this for this conversation, I I asked our audience to to send me some questions in advance. And by the mm -hmm. way, as a reminder, feel free to type your questions in the chat. I saw that maybe something is is coming. But before we get to to our questions from the chat, I did receive a few other questions. And one was, and by the way, it's something that I get asked all the time in my work. Maybe it's something that you get asked too, Matt. Mm -hmm. Which is, how do you answer a question? 
that you don't have the answer for. And, and that happens not just in spontaneous speaking. Sometimes it happens in the Q&A of a more formal communication scenario, like a formal presentation, for example. So you, you get asked the question, you don't have an answer to that question. What would you recommend? Yes. So this is one of the, the top questions I always get. What do I do if I don't know the answer to a question? And the answer is, say, I don't know. And then immediately follow it up with what you will do to find the answer and then get back to the person. We often feel that saying, I don't know, will ruin our credibility. There's actually some preliminary research that suggests that by saying, I don't know, telling people you'll follow up and then actually following up increases your credibility because you're de demonstrating tenacity, your ability to search out information and to return that information. So when I'm asked a question, I don't know, I do three things. First, I say, I don't know. I second, commit to finding the answer and getting back to the people. And third, if I have a hunch or an inkling, I will share that. I'll say, I, I, my hunch is the answer will be this, but I'll be sure to get back to you with the definitive answer. So now that shouldn't hurt you at all if you do it occasionally. Now, if you're doing it to every answer, then that's a different, that's a different issue. But certainly just admit you don't know. Far better than stumbling and bumbling or making up something that isn't true. I, I interviewed, I had the, the huge privilege of interviewing some time ago, Seth Gordon on the Ideas uh -huh. on Stage podcast, and he shared exactly the same thing. He said, I don't know is a sign of confidence. Also, for it's not the only reason, but the, the, the obvious reason, if we think about it, is that then when you do have the answer to a question, then precisely because you said, I don't know, to a previous question, then you just, they listen to you because they understand that if you do, if you don't have an answer, you are transparent and open. If you do have an answer, you can, you can share it. So exactly the same, the same idea. And before we continue, Phil, just checking, do we have any, by any chance, do we have any questions from our audience? Yes, uh, Andrea, we absolutely do. So if I uh, can ask you a first one, Matt, which uh, came from our yes. audience, um, and I'm going to, um, these are not coming in chronological order, but uh, here's one which I think is uh, probably appropriate right now, uh, which is how do you prepare for spontaneous interventions? Do you always have a few key messages or an elevator speech up your sleeve? So I'm not a big fan of that kind of preparation where you literally have something scripted out and you're just waiting to plug it in. Rather, I like to use the analogy of cooking. If you have a recipe and that's a structure, and I hope we get to talk about structure shortly, and you have some ingredients thought out, you can assemble a, an amazing meal. So I'm a big fan of stockpiling ideas, evidence, themes that you might want to cover and then in the moment, pulling from those ingredients and applying them to a specific recipe. So let's make this very practical and tactical. Imagine you have a job interview. As I'm preparing for the job interview, I think about what key skills and ideas do I bring to this job that might differentiate me? These are what I call themes. It might be that I'm incredibly collaborative or I have depth of knowledge in a particular area. And those are my themes. For each theme, I then stockpile or store examples that support the theme. Maybe I won some awards. Maybe I saved my company a certain amount of money. Maybe my boss said I'm the best employee who's ever done this type of role. And I have those stockpiled, pre-thought out. And then when I'm in the interview and the question comes in, I simply have to grab from the different things I've stockpiled and apply them to the recipe that I'm going to use to answer those questions. That's far different than memorizing an answer and then trying to fit that answer in to whatever question is asked. So uh, I do believe in preparing. I do believe in being thoughtful and thinking through themes and ideas you wanna get across and having some ways of supporting those, but not assembling them until you need to do so. Got it. And Phil, let's take another question from the audience and then we'll continue. Okay, let's do that then. So um, another question. So you were asked about structure. So we have another question coming in here. Do you have quick advice on how to quickly structure an improvised message? Maybe also involving the person asking. Absolutely. So structure is really key, I believe, to being effective in your spontaneous speaking, actually in any communication, 
written or spoken. So I mentioned that, that the methodology that I teach has two major components, mindset and, and messaging. Messaging is largely about structure. Structure is simply a logical connection of ideas. Our brains are not wired for lists. In fact, I, I ask all of you to think about how many items do you need to purchase from the grocery store before you actually have to write them down? If you're like me, it's four or five. Yeah, same thing. Exactly, Andrea. Both of us, four and no more. Uh, then I have to write them down. Our brains are not wired for lists or itemizations, not for bullet points. It's all about story and structure. So our brains are wired for things that have a beginning, middle, and an end. And there are myriad structures that you can use. So structure is like a recipe. It tells you the ordering of things that go together, and there's a logic to it. So my favorite structure, and it is a multi-purpose structure, it's one you can use in many situations, is three simple questions. What? So what? Now what? What is your idea? It's your answer. It's your update. It's your feedback. It's your product. It's your service. It's why you are speaking. The so what gets to the point of the question you asked, Phil, is it makes it relevant for the audience. We have known for several decades that if your content is relevant, salient, and specific to your audience, they are more likely to take value from it, act on it, and remember it. And then the final step is now what? What comes next? So let me give you two quick examples. Imagine you're in a team meeting and somebody asks you for an update. Your update begins with the what? Here's what I have done or what I am doing. The so what is why is it important for the mission, vision, values of the organization? And then the now what is what are my next steps or what do I need from you? So it helps me package it up in a clear way. I don't have to worry about how am I going to say this? I just have to think about the individual ingredients I'm going to put into the recipe. Similarly, imagine Andrea, Andrea asks me for feedback. I give the feedback. The feedback is, you're an amazing podcast host. Thank you. I'd love for you to include more questions about, and I give him some advice. That's my what. When you include more diversity of questions, it brings in more audience members. That's the so what. So next time you and I have an opportunity to chat, please ask me questions about X. Do you see how the structure, what, so what, now what, helps me package up the information? So having a recipe, having ingredients pre-thought out helps you in the moment be spontaneous. So it is all about having the structures and being able to deploy them that can really help you do better in your spontaneous speaking. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Matt. So let's do this. I've got a couple of other questions. Now we can go back to questions from our audience. One comes from something that happened two days ago. I was working with the client in preparation for, that was a formal presentation. It was a kind of TEDx style sure. presentation for an internal company event. But the same thing, even more, I guess, happens when it comes to spontaneous speaking, which is blanking out. So yes. in that particular case, that person had been rehearsing. So she was prepared. But for some reason, during the rehearsals, and that was the day before the presentation, she would often blank out as mm -hmm. she was rehearsing. And again, that happens even more when we are speaking spontaneously. So do you have any recommendations for either avoiding uh, to, to blank out? Or if we do blank out, if we don't remember what to say, what can we do? I know that there is a very practical tip from your book, but I don't want to spoil it. If you don't mention it, then I remind you, but I'll leave it with you for now. Uh, Matt, I don't know. I can't, I can't hear you if you're speaking. I don't know what's, uh, Matt, I don't know what's happening. Um, uh, Phil, can you please unmute uh, Matt? I don't know what happened. Yeah. We'll do that, Matt. Sorry about worry. that. Sorry about that. I had to cough and I muted myself and then Zoom decided not to let me back to unmute myself. I'm sorry. Uh, so f the fear of forgetting is the number one fear that I, that people report to me. Uh, blanking out is something that really scares people. It is not as likely as people are afraid that it is. So let me give you some advice about what we can do in advance to reduce the likelihood of blanking out. And then let me share with you some things we can do if we actually do blank out. So 
Having a structure, by the way, is a key to not forgetting. Because if I have a structure beyond it being a recipe, it's also a roadmap. So if I'm using what, so what, now what, and I'm in the midst of speaking and I'm like, oh no, what comes next? I can't remember. I just have to remind myself, I just covered what. I always know that so what follows what. So one way to help you is to have a structure because not only is it a recipe, it's a roadmap. So it can tell you the direction you're going. The second thing that helps is not memorizing. Memorizing actually increases the likelihood that you will blank out. I talked earlier about cognitive bandwidth. Your brain is like a computer. It's not a perfect analogy, but it works fairly well for this. The more I am doing at one time, the more tasks I'm running, just like a computer, the less well I do on any of them. So if I'm constantly comparing what I'm saying to what I intended to say in my script, I'm reducing the bandwidth I have to actually say it at all. So we want to avoid memorizing. We want to make sure that we have a structure and then we can also reduce pressure by doing what's called rationalization. This is a psychological process that helps us feel better about certain situations that make us nervous. In this case, I challenge everybody listening to think about the next time you have to communicate in the moment. What is the likelihood that you will actually blank out on a scale of zero to 100? Zero being won't happen to 100 being absolutely 100% it will happen. If you're like most people, you come in at around 20%. Most people say there's a 20% chance I'll blank out, which means there's an 80% chance that you won't. And if you're a betting person, that's a great set of odds. And I would bet on it every time. So by realizing that it's not as likely to happen as we think, by having a structure and by not memorizing, we reduce significantly the likelihood that we will blank out. Now let's assume the worst, we actually blank out. We now have no idea what we want to say next. Two things to do. First, repeat yourself. We can often remember what we just said before uh, when we forget what we're trying to say next. So simply repeat yourself and it will often get you out back on track. Now, many of us feel repeating ourselves makes us look silly or makes us look like we don't know what we're doing. In fact, repetition is very common. We say the same thing over and over again. Repeating yourself can actually be helpful. Do you see what I did there? I said the same thing four times. It's not that bad. If that doesn't work, the last rip cord you can pull to save yourself is to distract your audience. Get them doing something else so you can think. Easiest way to do this, ask a question. If any of you ever participate in one of my classes and you hear me say the following, it means I've totally forgotten what I wanna say next. If you ever hear me say, Let's pause for a moment and I'd like for you to think about how we've just what we've, we've just discussed can be applied to your life. And when my students hear this, they don't think, oh, he's forgotten what he wants to say. They say, oh my goodness, how does this apply to my life? And it gives me just a, enough time. All of you can come up with one of these emergency questions you can ask. It could be something as simple as, how does what we've just discussed impact this meeting? Or how does this align with our corporate goals? And simply by having that question or simply by knowing that you can go back to go forward, again, it reduces the likelihood you'll blank out because you know what to do if you actually do blank out. So big problem, lots of things we can do to reduce the likelihood that it will happen. Uh, Matt, lots of things we can do. And one of them is also counterintuitive because when we think about, okay, I don't remember what to say next, then naturally, what do we start thinking about? what i'm supposed to say next right, While, right. But, so but it's counterintuitive but actually if we think about what we've just said instead either by repeating ourselves or by thinking about it that that can help so another counterintuitive ideas but very very useful and man let me ask you another question that will go back to to our audience another question i got asked before these before this session is is this how do you insert your point in a meeting when there are other people talking. So it could be a, a meeting with a few people, even a small meeting, and you want to say something, but you find it hard to do that because maybe there is that person who is loud, louder than you and you find it hard to insert your point. Do you have any recommendations? Yes, so this is something I'm asked a lot. Uh, people have something to contribute, but the conversation is going fast and furiously, or you're thinking of your thoughts and, and, and you just need that extra second, and then you want to insert your point, and you want to do it sooner than later because you want to get it in before the train leaves the station. And 
this can be hard to do, but I have three suggestions. First, interrupt through paraphrasing. Paraphrasing is an amazing tool. A paraphrase is not where you repeat everything that was said, but you extract the key idea. So let's imagine we are in the midst of an implementation meeting where we're all planning how we're going to implement this product or the service or whatever. And people are talking and I want to insert my point of view. I might extract one thing that they've talked about and assert it and then attach my contribution to it. So I might say cost is really important because they were just talking about how we we're going to pay for all of this. And I simply say cost is really important. And then I add my point as it relates to cost and what was that, what else was said. So paraphrasing gives you permission to interrupt because it's on point and you're naming that point to consolidate what was being discussed. So that's one way. The second way is to lead with a question. So as the conversation's going, I might say, but what about cost? And again, asking a question relevant to what's on topic is appropriate to interrupt with. And then finally, you can lead with an emotion. I'm very concerned about cost. Or that makes me happy when we think about cost. So by inserting an emotion, asking a question, or paraphrasing, those are all polite and acceptable ways to insert your contribution into what is being said. So you lead with one of those. I call it a wedge. You wedge in with one of those, and then you add your contribution next. Matt, you made me think about another question, but if I remember... If I don't blank out, I'll go back <laughs> to that question later. For now, Phil, do we have any other questions from, from our audience? Yes, we do. Absolutely, Andrea. So we've got uh, a few questions here. Here's one which you just mentioned, emotion. So Victoria asked, how do we stay focused on the idea when you feel that emotions start to take over? Yes. Yeah, so um, my father recently passed away, and I was asked to give the eulogy. And I was very concerned about this issue. I really wanted to respect my father, honor his life. And I was afraid that I was just going to get too emotional. This is an extreme case. Uh, but emotions are important. They're what make us human. We connect through our emotions. But sometimes our emotions, positive and negative, happy and sad, can influence and affect what we're saying. So just like I suggested with spontaneous speaking, we should prepare ourselves for this. We should think about how it might be when we're delivering this information. And if it's spontaneous, just think what might happen that could get me really excited or overly excited or overly angry or concerned so that you actually think about it and you prepare yourself for what you might do. Maybe I'll take a few breaths. Maybe I'll have a question ready to ask people. If it's a planned communication, then you can actually practice. And this is what I did for my father's eulogy. I would purposely talk about him and have conversations with people that knew him and care. So we would, we would get emotional, we'd get sad. And then as soon as I was done with that conversation, I would go practice my eulogy. So I would put myself in that emotional state and then try it. I learned this again. I learned a lot from uh, basketball. I, my, my two boys were big basketball players and they had some amazing coaches. And one of their coaches said the best way to learn how to do free throws. And if you knew the game of ba basketball, you're, you're playing, you're hot and heavy, the game is going on and then a foul happens and everything stops. You have to calm yourself down and take a shot that's really hard to make. So he used to have the kids do lots of drills, run around, get crazy, and then have them stop and shoot to prepare them for that. And essentially, I took that same advice for preparing myself for the situation when I had to give a, a presentation, a, a eulogy to honor my father. I put myself in an emotional situation that was very difficult, and then I practiced. So there are things we can do to prepare. But first and foremost, we just have to realize that our emotions can play out in the midst of our communication. Many of us are surprised by it. It's like, I didn't expect to be that upset, or I didn't expect to be that sad. So we have to think about it in advance and then think about ways that we might deal with it. Uh, Matt, you you also here in your answer, you talked about the importance of practicing also mm -hmm. in conditions which are as close as possible to the real yes. conditions. It could be an emotional condition. It could be physical conditions. Mm -hmm. You made me think about a similar example that I know from football or, or soccer, mm -hmm. as, you, yeah. as you say in the U.S., uh, sometimes football or soccer coaches to prepare their, their, their players for penalty uh, for penalty mm -hmm. kicks 
what they do, they let them practice the whole thing, not just the penalty itself, but if you have a penalty at the end of a game, then you need to walk from the, the center of the field, of, of the pitch. Mm -hmm. You need to walk maybe, what is it, 50 meters or something. And then, and as you do that, that builds pressure. And then you look at the the goalkeeper, and then you you give it a try, rather than just practicing in conditions which are not very very close to to the real conditions. And the same is true when preparing for communication. Definitely very true for preparing a formal presentation. We need to practice. We need to try and do our best to practice in conditions which are as close as possible to the real conditions. Before we continue, uh, Phil, do we have, maybe can we take one or two other questions from the audience? Yes, Andrea, we absolutely can. So there's one which I think will follow up quite uh, neatly from the one which we just had. This one comes from um, Yasmina. Uh, and this, it follows up on emotion, but it's more of a, it's a more difficult emotion particularly, or even could be discussed as not being, it's anxiety. So her question is what to do if, despite all of the preparation, all of the things you talked about uh, in your previous answer, but what happens if the anxiety overwhelms us during the speaking? For example, you know what you're supposed to say, but your voice just breaks down. What would your advice be? So there are many, many things we can do to manage our anxiety before and during our communication. They boil down into two categories. They boil down to both symptoms and sources, managing the symptoms that you experience, the losing your voice, the sweaty brow, the rapid heart rate, and then the sources. And we've talked about several sources already, trying to be perfect, seeing it as a threat or a challenge. These are all things that can be very difficult for us. In the moment, if something happens that ignites or catalyzes your anxiety, anything you can do to calm yourself down will help, taking a deep breath moving around instead of standing still. These are things that will help give you a little bit more of a sense of agency and control. Realize that it's normal and natural to be nervous when speaking in front of people and reminding of ourselves of that can also help. Again, much like I suggested when we blank out, if you can do something that buys yourself just a little bit of time to collect your thoughts, that can be really helpful. So you can ask a question, you can ask people to read a document, you can ask them to turn to each other and share something they've taken away, but giving yourself just that fraction of a second can help. Now, a little bit of a tangential bit of advice, many of us get most nervous at the beginning of our communication, planned or spontaneous. So if you can do something that engages the audience and changes your relationship to them, that's really useful. In my coaching, I coached a very senior leader at Google once, and he was a nervous speaker. And what we did is every the beginning of every one of his major talks in front of hundreds or thousands of people, he would start with a quick video clip. He'd show a YouTube clip that was like 15 to 30 seconds. And as soon as it was, it was over, he would then facilitate a discussion about it. He would take a poll or get people sharing their points of view. And this was really helpful for him because it allowed him to be a facilitator, not a presenter. So are there things you can do at the times you expect to be most nervous that give you a little bit of a break? While people are watching the video, he would take a deep breath. These are the things that can really help you to be more in control in those moments when you feel out of control. And I'm glad, Matt, that, that you emphasized, again, the fact that it's, it's completely normal to feel nervous. Um, I don't want to take me as an example, but... I do this all the time, give presentations, communication. I always feel nervous before presenting. I was feeling a bit nervous before this conversation too. And so thanks for sharing that. Now, Phil, let's take one more question. And then depending on how much time we have, we'll see how we can proceed. Okay, excellent. So one more question then. And this one comes from Pedro. And Pedro's question is, how can the brain be trained for spontaneous speaking? How can the brain be trained for spontaneous speaking? Yes. So this can be quite challenging, uh, but there are many steps you can take. And the methodology I play out, I, I suggest, is, is a great way to do it. But you need to actually get repetitions. You know, So the methodology prepares you, gives you the tools, but to train your brain, you actually have to do it. So lots of things you can do. Put yourself in environments and situations where you can prepare. What does that mean? Well, so do Toastmasters, for example. 
Uh, join a group where they give you opportunities to speak planned and spontaneous. Give yourself low stakes situations. Maybe it's a family dinner, or maybe it's out when you're out among friends where the stakes are lower. That can help. Similarly, uh, you can use generative AI. If you're going in for a job interview, you can type into ChatGPT, Bard, and the like. You can tap in, type in, here's the position I'm interviewing for at the company I'm interviewing. And then you can actually ask it to generate questions that you then practice answering. Again, the goal is not to memorize. The goal is just to train your brain, to actually drill it. So repetition is really important. That's how we get better. You don't think about being a better speaker. You do being a better speaker, and you have to work on it. Matt, if you think about what we've talked about so far uh, and all of these ideas related to in-the-moment communication, I've got many other questions or topics that we could explore, but I'd be curious, like from your perspective, what what have we missed so far? Is is there anything that you would have liked me or someone in the audience to ask you and we haven't done it yet? Uh, have we missed anything? So the biggest thing that we haven't talked about that I think is really important in these situations is listening. And I know that sounds strange that we're talking about spontaneous speaking, but listening is critical. We have to listen in a deep way to better understand what's needed in the moment. Most of us are not great listeners. Andrea, you're a very good listener, but most of us listen just enough to get the gist of what somebody is saying, and then we immediately switch into response mode. How are we going to respond? I'm judging and evaluating what you've said. I'm thinking about the stakes of what I'm about to say. We need to listen for the bottom line, not the top line. We need to pay attention to what's happening in the physical environment. We need to pay attention to how somebody is saying things so that we can better respond. I will give you an example. Imagine somebody asks you for feedback and you immediately say, okay, they want feedback and you itemize all the things that went wrong or could have gone better. But had you paid attention, you might have noticed that that person was speaking more quietly. They were looking away. What they really wanted was not feedback. They wanted support. And itemizing all the things they did wrong actually works exactly opposite to what was needed in that moment. So the one thing we haven't talked about that I think is really important in all communication, but especially spontaneous communication, is listening. Thank you, Matt. And let's take one more question from our audience. I see one from Molly in the chat. She says, do you have any tips on speaking a language which is not your mother tongue? And, and I guess that that's i can relate to that of course obviously english is not yes. my first language and and that and that is one of those questions which is which are relevant both to formal presenting and communication and even more when it comes to spontaneous speaking do you do you have any any tips there matt certainly so Many, many of you listening, many of the people I work with uh, speak more than one language. And quite frankly, I am in awe. I, I, I barely speak my native language well. Uh, it is hard. It is hard. Uh, I host a podcast uh, called Think Fast, Talk Smart, much like Andrea does. And it's all about communication. And I had an expert on English language learning, somebody who teaches people how to speak English as their second language. And he made a point that has resonated with me for years. He and I interviewed many years ago. And the point he made is the goal of somebody speaking not their na native language is not to sound like a native speaker. It is simply to get your point across. And this gets back to the same notion we started our conversation with, which is we have to get out of our own way. When I am judging and evaluating everything I say against some criteria about what a native speaker would sound like, that puts a lot of pressure on me and reduces the likelihood that I will actually communicate well. So I suggest that everybody who's speaking in a language not their own, just focus on getting your point across. And by doing that, you will actually have a better chance of succeeding than if you're trying to sound like a native speaker. The second bit of advice I would say, again, goes back to something I mentioned earlier, repeat yourself, but do it differently. So make a point and then tell a story that reinforces the point or make a point and then use some kind of statistic or analogy. It is through this repetition that people will get the information you're saying. And then the last thing I'll say, and this just has to do with accents. Humans are very good at adjusting and adapting to different accents. 
but we have to hear it first. Here's my biggest uh, concern is when you introduce yourself for the first time, how do you typically introduce yourself? You say your name. Well, if I don't recognize your accent right away and you're saying your name, it can be very confusing to me. So I recommend to everybody who has an accent and myself when I'm speaking in a culture where my, my way of speaking is an accent is to always start the introduction with something other than your name. So I might say, I'm somebody who's passionate about communication. My name is Matt Abrahams. And in doing that, people get to hear, oh, that's how he speaks during the part where I'm saying I'm passionate about communication. So when I say my name, your brain is already adapted, so you better hear it. So there are things we can do to make it easier for our listeners if we have an accent. And there are things we can do to mindset shift so we can actually do better in the communication we have. Love it. So you made me think that perhaps I need to change the way I introduce myself because normally I do say, my name is Andrea. Um, right. So perhaps I, I, I should revisit that. So thank you. And Matt, just final question. If anyone would like to connect with you, what should they do? Where do they find you? Well, I know you and I are both very uh, vociferous on LinkedIn. Please, please link in with me. I, I do a lot of work there. Uh, also, check out my website, mattabrahams.com. Lots of resources there, free for people to use. And then finally, listen in to Think Fast, Talk Smart, or check out the book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter. All resources to help people get better and feel more confident in their communication. And we are going to include all the, the links because there will be a recording for, for this session when we publish it. And also, we couldn't cover all, all the questions. But as I said at the beginning, I interviewed Matt a few weeks ago on the mm -hmm. Ideas on Stage podcast. And in that podcast, we talked about if we explored a few other topics. So feel free to check it out. The links are here in, in the chat. And also, just feel free to type Matt Abraham's Ideas on Stage podcast, either on YouTube or where, wherever you listen to your podcasts. All right, Matt, thank you so much. Let's do, let me mention just a couple of things before we, before we close. And what I like to do, I'm going to share my screen and Phil, if you don't mind, maybe thumbs up. Can you confirm that you, that we can see that you can see my, my slide? Okay, perfect. All right, so I just want to take an opportunity to say a like, big thank you to our supporting partners. For this event, we've got four amazing organizations that have decided, decided to align themselves to, to, to the themes and topics of, of this event, the Visual Jam, Everyday People, Startups Magazine, and Impact Hub London. So check them out, great organizations. Again, the links will be or, or are in the chart already. And they've been very kind to include just for you a list of free resources or discounts promotions by the way in this virtual goodie bag we also have free resources from matt as well and so feel free to check it out the the link is here you can also find it in the chat if you prefer there is a qr code so you can take a screenshot of this slide and then you can access the the goodie bag that way a couple of other things scorecard and masterclass if you've never seen this tool here check it out the confident presenter scorecard which is a way for you to very quickly assess your current presentation skills in less than three minutes for free you just need to answer a few questions and then you'll get a score the tool will tell you what that score means for you and it also identifies opportunities for improvement so again the links will be in the chat as well check it out and the other thing is the masterclass. Now, I don't know whether if you've if you've never attended our masterclasses, in addition to these special events, I'm running a bi-weekly masterclass online. It's less than an hour on all things presentation skills. And Matt, for example, mentioned at the beginning that there is no right way to communicate. And I agree. So, for example, the Matt at the moment, the title of the web class is how I create my own presentations, but not because I want to make it about me. And also I agree with you, not because I think that there is just one right way to do that, but that's the best way I know. So in that web class, I go through 
a, a step by step method and approach some principles. And these are the principles that I use when I create my own presentations. And we follow exactly the same principles when we work with our clients. So again, if you've never attended those sessions, feel free to, to check it out. I'd love to see you there. And finally, but this is only for those who are seriously motivated to take their presentation skills to a higher level. And for those who are ready to do something about it, to take action, to make it happen. Then if that's you, at the moment, I have an opportunity for five completely free presentation consultations to, to see if there is a fit between what you may be looking for and what we have to offer. And regardless of whether or not there's a good fit, I can promise you that if you attend the consultation, you'll walk away with much greater clarity on how you and all your teams, your colleagues, can become more confident presenters. And you'll also walk away with a free copy of my book, Confident Presenter, just for agreeing to have a chat. Now, if you're interested, super simple, all you need to do is just type yes in the chat now, either in the private chat, I see a few yeses already there, or in the public chat, whatever you prefer. Just to clarify though, if you type yes, you are not committing to anything. You're just telling me that you would like to learn more about what the consultation is about. So if you do that, then I'll get in touch. I'll give you more information. And, and then if together we see that, that we are in alignment, then we'll go ahead and find a time to speak. And that's it. Now, if there's one thing I would really like you to, to take away from this session is that if you think about it, any difficulty in your roles, in your business, in your careers can be traced back to a communication deficiency, which means that most likely somewhere there's a bit of a lack of communication skills. For example, if your business is not growing, for sure somewhere there's a bit of a lack of communication skills. If you are finding it hard to lead your teams, definitely there's a communication deficiency. If you are struggling to make an impact for causes you care about, there's a communication deficiency. Any difficulty in your business, roles or careers boils down to a communication deficiency. So if you think that that might be the case in your situation, that you need to be intentional about what you're going to do about it and when. Because you see, many people attend sessions like this, they listen to podcasts, they watch YouTube videos, and then what, what do they do? Nothing. They procrastinate. They think that now is not the right time, and so they'll wait for the perfect time. The truth is, there will never be a perfect time. The perfect time to start your journey to becoming the best presenter you can be is now. Mastering the art of public speaking can be rewarding. It's definitely rewarding, but there's no reward without action. In this context, good things don't come to those who wait. So if this speaks to you, here is my invitation to you. Start your journey now. Start your journey to becoming the best presenter you can be today, not tomorrow. Start your journey to becoming the best version of yourself as a communicator today, not tomorrow. Of course, if you do choose to start that journey, then I'd love for you to share it, share it with us. The best way for both of us to see if that makes sense is for you to express your interest in the free consultation I mentioned. Again, feel free to type yes in the chat if you haven't done it yet. If you've started that journey already, that's great. Keep going, you won't regret it, and your audience will thank you. And I also want to thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you find it useful. Thank you very much to Phil for your support today, to our special guest, Matt. Again, thank you for your time and for sharing all your insights. And, and again, for everyone, I do hope again that you enjoyed it, that you find it useful. Let's keep in touch. All the very best. Ciao.